Okay, now hopefully you can hear me nice and clearly. I'd like you, please, if you would turn to the book of Esther and chapter 9, Esther chapter 9. And we're going to read the first 16 verses. And we're going to be thinking about the fight and the feast, uh, the defeat of the Jews' enemies, and the origin of the Feast of Purim. So beginning in verse 1 of Esther chapter 9. It begins this way, now in the 12th month, that is the month Adar, on the 13th day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put in execution, in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary that the Jews had rule over them that hated them. The Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus to lay hand on such as sought their hurt. And no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon all the people. And all the rulers of the provinces and the lieutenants and the deputies and officers of the king helped the Jews, because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame went out throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai waxed greater and greater. Thus the Jews smote all their enemies with a stroke of the sword, and slaughter, and destruction, and did what they would unto those that hated them. And in Shushan the palace, the Jews slew and destroyed 500 men, and Pashandathar, and Dalphon, and Aspather, and Purather, and Adalia, and Aridather, and Palm, Palmashta, and Arisai, and Aridai, and Vazijeth, eh, Vazijether, the ten sons of Haman, the sons of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, slew they, but on the spoil laid they not their hand. On that day, the number of those that were slain in Shushan, the palace, was brought before the king. And the king said unto Esther, the queen, the Jews have slain and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the palace, and the ten sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's province? Now, what is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. Or what is thy request further? And it shall be done. Then said Esther, if it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews which are in Shushan to do tomorrow also according unto this day's decree, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. And the king commanded it so to be done. And the decree was given at Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together on the 14th day also of the month Adar, and slew 300 men at Shushan. But on the prey they laid not their hand. But the other Jews that were in the king's provinces gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies, and slew of their foes 70 and 5,000, but they laid not their hands on the prey. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. I want to just uh, kind of give an outline before we begin, just kind of how we're going to look at this section. In verses 1 through 5, we have the, the reasons for the Jewish success. How did they succeed in their mission of not only defending themselves against a hostile enemy, but actually winning against a hostile enemy? So we'll think of the reason of the Jews' success. Then verse 6 through 16, we'll, we'll look at the numbering of the dead. A kind of a reckoning of the number that had been slaughtered. And then uh, if we get beyond that from verse 17 through 19, we'll look at days of feasting and gladness, uh, how uh, this uh, victory uh, brought about times of great feasting and gladness amongst the Jews throughout the empire. And of course, connected with that, verse 20 through 22, the institution of an annual festival, what we call the Feast of Purim, uh, where its origins are, how it began. And then verse 23 to 28, there's a solemn undertaking, and that is making sure that every Jew 
uh, does indeed keep this festival because of the, the decree written and sent out. And then verse 29 through 32, there's a royal confirmation uh, confirmed by Queen Esther uh, and King Ahasuerus that this was to be done. So as we consider the fight and then the feast. So we, we come to this day, the 12th month, that is the month Adar, the 13th day of the same month. And of course, this day was the day that the Jews of the kingdom had formerly dreaded. It was now approaching. It was to have been a day of terrible slaughter and the elimination of all Jews, men, women, and children. It would have been a complete eradication of the Jewish race throughout the 127 provinces of the vast kingdom of Ahasuerus. So the day that they had formerly dreaded, however, would become a day that the Jews' enemies own do, and that of the people whom they despised would be the ones who would, uh, as it were, deliver this doom upon them. They had anticipated on this day the land would flow with Jewish blood. The entire race would be destroyed. There would be a great spoil uh, that would be gathered in for their enemies. But as the narr narrative itself records it, it tells us it was turned to the contrary. And the Lord has a wonderful way of turning things upon their head, uh, as it were, reversing the enemy's attempts to do things. He's a wonderful way of doing this. Uh, so many times this has happened, even in recent history, uh, where the Jews have been overwhelmed uh, in terms of numerically by their enemies who were set out with one goal to completely eradicate the Jews. And God, as it were, turned it on its head and turned out to be a great victory for the Jews. And so we see this here uh, on this particular occasion. And what we could say is that it, Jehovah in his sovereignty was to order something completely contrary on that day, and it would be remembered from that day forward as a day of great triumph for his people. I really believe that it's a kind of precursor uh, to what's going to happen on a coming day, at what we call the Battle of Armageddon, when the enemies of God will be thinking to themselves that they have now an opportunity of bringing about the final solution and wiping out the Jewish race, and as it were, eradicating the God of Israel with them. And of course, uh, we know the rest of the story that God, even on that day, is going to turn everything on its head. And the Lord Jesus coming from heaven uh, will indeed uh, bring about a great slaughter of all the enemies of the Jews. And again, we'll, uh, we'll turn the tide and it will begin a, a, a thousand years of glorious celebration of the victory of the Lord. We notice in verse 2, it says, The Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus to lay hand on such as sought their hurt. And no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon the people. So there, there are actually three reasons, really, why they failed in their attempt to eradicate the Jews. We're going to kind of list them, and then we'll look at them. First of all, uh, we know that the Jews had plenty of time to prepare themselves. We saw that last time, that they, the announcement had been sent, that they could defend themselves. There was lots of time for that to take place. And so they had time to prepare. The surprise element uh, was lost. They were able to prepare themselves properly to defend themselves. The second reason, as we'll see in this verse, is that uh, no one could withstand them, verse 2, at the end, for the fear of them fell upon the people. So God put a supernatural fear of the Jews upon the people, which perhaps kept some back who might have been tempted to join in the assault. It, it, it restrained them. It's kind of like a restraining fear uh, that God placed upon the people. And then the third reason we'll see in verse 3 is that they had the Jews had the support of the authorities. 
Again, verse 3, all the rulers of the provinces, the lieutenants, the deputies, officers of the king, helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. So three specific reasons. Uh, of course, behind these three reasons is one reason, and that is the promises and purposes of God uh, to preserve this nation are there behind the scenes. But, but from a human standpoint, three things stand out. First of all, we've already said they had time to prepare for their self-defense. After the decree worded by Mordecai was sent out with haste, they had most of the summer, all of the, 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 the fall or the autumn period, as well as the mint winter months to prepare for that fateful day. Now, I don't know what they did, whether they uh, they they practiced sword fighting or what they did, but they, they were well prepared. They were ready for their enemies. They used the time wisely, and they were ready for that day when they were to be attacked. And then we saw again in verse 2 that the fear of them fell upon the people everywhere. There was a, a, maybe a realization that some divine power was at work on the behalf of the Jews. Of course, Israel had seen this in their past. Uh, there'd been many occasions where the, the fear of them fell upon their enemies. And I want to just take a time to look at uh, some of these examples in scripture uh, where the fear of the Jews fell upon the people and hindered uh, them attacking the Jews. One example, and the first uh, the first occasion of this would be in Genesis 35 and in verse 5. And this, of course, is after the slaughter of the men of Shechem. And, uh, of course, Jacob was concerned that he and his family would be destroyed uh, because of what they had done. And so we read in, in Genesis 35, verse 5, and they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. And so even though they were just a, a tiny family, in a sense, in this sea of, of Canaanite civilization, and yet it says the fear of God, the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they didn't pursue after the sons of Jacob. Uh, if you look at the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 2, Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 25, we read this. It says, I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land. That's chapter 3. And that's why it's not reading right. Sorry, chapter 2, verse 25. This day will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations that are under the whole heaven who shall hear report of thee and shall tremble and be in anguish because of thee. So again, once again, God puts his fear upon the surrounding nations. They're about to, uh, as it were, invade uh, the land of Canaan, uh, hopelessly outnumbered numerically, uh, but God is going to put uh, the fear, uh, his fear, of the, the Jews upon them. And so we see it again in the book of Joshua. In chapter 2, just this simple pattern of God doing this on behalf of his people. Again, based on the promise in Deuteronomy. But in Joshua 2 and verse 8, we read, And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, this is Rahab the harlot, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us, that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites and that were on the other side, Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt, and neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. And so she eloquently 
describes the events that had taken place because of what God had done for them. People observed that and a fear of God and fear of the Jews fell upon them. And we can see the same pattern, can't we, with how God had uh, somehow destroyed Haman uh, and uh, brought Mordecai to a place of prominence. All these events would have caused throughout the empire the fear of the Jews to fall upon them. And we see again Joshua 5 verse 1. It came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. And then one more reference just to show uh, how God had used this in a marvelous way in Joshua chapter 9 and verse 24. Once more we read this. And they answered Joshua and said, Because it was certainly told thy servants how that the Lord thy God commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. Therefore we were sore afraid of our lives because of you and have done this thing and so you can see that that god has done this before uh, he's he's uh, got a track record of this and it's really interesting when you think about this fear that god puts in the hearts of people uh, we notice it too in the new testament that there were times when there was a fear came upon the people of the land of Israel because of what God was doing with the church. Uh, God, God's fear fell upon the surrounding people. Uh, and we see it uh, on numerous occasions. And certainly we see it in times of revival. There is a sense of a fear of God that comes in society when God is working in revival power amongst his people tragically i think what we're witnessing today is more like what we read in romans chapter 3 and verse 18 that there's no fear of god before their eyes but it's a wonderful thing when the unsaved see something god is doing for his people and it puts fear into them and i just want to give you one example from the new testament where uh, we read of how unsaved people will respond. And it, it's in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 24 and 25. It says, if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he'll worship God and report that God is in you of the truth. And wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if the unsaved could see such clear evidence that God was in us of a truth, that even when we gathered together, that the presence of God was so evident that unsaved people would be caused to fall down on their faces, worship God, and report that God is in you of a truth. Instead, tragically, the godless world is, instead of being afraid of the church, it's the reverse. The church seems to be afraid of the world and imitated or uh, intimidated by the world rather than the other way around. But certainly we see that this had a great impact in the days of Mordecai, that the fear uh, fell upon the people. And that in, inhibited their ability to uh, enact their plan uh, to wipe out the Jews. So they're time to prepare because of the decree of Mordecai. Uh, no man could withstand them for the fear of them fell upon the people. And then verse three, it says, all the rulers of the provinces and the lieutenants and the deputies and officers of the king helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. So the Jews had the unequivocal support of the authorities in every province 
whether they assisted military or financially or simply gave moral support or encouragement is not explained. But what is explained is that it was evident that the authorities were in support of the Jews. And again, I don't believe it was out of love for the Jews, but out of fear for Mordecai. He has uh, rocketed now to being the chief minister, also uh, directly related to the queen, who also is a Jew. And so it would be seen for people who might be tempted to get involved, uh, this would be a bad career move, especially for authorities, the rulers of the provinces. Uh, if they were to show favoritism to the Jews' enemies, it certainly would not be bode well for them uh, in their uh, chance of making progress in the empire. And so the lesser authorities throughout the provinces rightly deemed it wise to keep in the favor of Mordecai. And so they also supported the Jewish people rather than um, giving uh, into any temptation uh, to join in the attempt to spoil the Jews. And again, it tells us why the fear of Mordecai fell upon them, because verse 4 says, For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame went throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai waxed greater and greater. His influence became very preeminent throughout the empire, just like we saw it with Joseph on the Pharaoh. We see that same influence now uh, with Mordecai, just as we saw it with Daniel in Babylon. We see it now uh, with Mordecai. He's waxing greater and greater. God has elevated this humble man uh, and given him great position and great power. And so that influence is, uh, is tremendous throughout the empire and causing officials to think twice about getting involved against the Jews. So verse 5 uh, gives us a kind of a summary of what happened next. Thus, as a result of these three reasons, time to prepare, fear falling on the people, support from the authorities, it says, thus the Jews smote all their enemies with a stroke of the sword and slaughter and destruction and did what they would unto those that hated them. Isn't it somewhat remarkable, in spite of the fact that the, the, the king had authorized the Jews to retaliate in their cities, that they also now had the support of provincial authorities, that there were still many enemies who foolishly rose up against them on that day that had been appointed for their, their slaughter. And again, it, it indicates something of the deep-seated anti-Semiticism which smoldered in the hearts of many in the Persian Empire, that despite all of these factors, these three reasons that we've already cited, there were still those that attempted to spoil the Jews and to slaughter them. But as we've learned already, uh, God turned it around. God turned the whole thing upside down. And so verse 6 says, And in Shushan the palace, the Jews slew and destroyed 500 men. And of course, one of the things the king is going to ask when we get down to verse 12 is, if that's what's happened just in Shushan the palace, what has happened throughout the empire? If this is a, a, a batch sample of what's going on, if 500 right here, uh, as it were, in Shushan the palace, what's it going to be throughout the empire? Uh, obviously, a great slaughter is going to take place. So it says the Jews destroyed 500 men. Now, it's interesting. Again, we, we talked about the fact that the, the decree had given them permission to slaughter uh, whoever they wanted who were attacking them, whether they were men, women, or children. And we talked about that a little bit in our last session. But what's interesting is that these 500 men that were slaughtered in the palace, the word men is the Hebrew word ish, and it's not, it, it indicates males specifically. And so it would imply to us that the Jews smote only those fighting men who rose up against them, uh, 
and were hostile to them, and they did not touch the women and the children. There were 500 males who were destroyed in Shushan, the palace. And probably the Jews of Shushan concentrated on such enemies as were to be found in the fortress. Uh, like this is, it tells us specifically, doesn't it, that it's in Shushan, the palace. And obviously these were powerful, uh, as it were, uh, enemies that were perhaps very influenced by Haman, uh, the uh, the Agagite, and, and so considered to be the most dangerous, uh, the known enemies of the Jews. And so we, we read of these in the fortress, perhaps thinking they were safe uh, in the palace quarter, uh, thinking it would be a safe haven. Uh, these 500 were slaughtered. Of course, he goes on to tell us that amongst the most notable casualties of the slaughter, and the only ones that are actually named for us, and we tried to pronounce them once and we're not going to uh, pronounce them again, are the 10 sons of Haman that are mentioned here in verses 7, 8, and 9. And so it lists for, the, for us, and there's the only ones that are named, it tells us in verse 10, the 10 sons of Haman, the sons of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews slew they, but on the spoil laid not they their hand. And so not only Haman had been destroyed, but now these 10 sons, which he had boasted of in the past. And it would seem that the 10 sons were greatly influenced by their father. And it did not deter them, uh, perhaps even out of their opportunity to get revenge, that they sought the slaughter of the Jews. And they paid the ultimate price, not only sharing their father's riches, they had also shared their father's anti-Semiticism and harbored a desire for revenge for the hanging of their father. But they were told were indeed slaughtered amongst the 500 uh, that perished in Shushan, the palace. But it's of great credit to the Jews that we read that despite the king's decree giving them permission to spoil their enemies, whoever they slew, one of the things that the text tells us again and again and again is that they didn't touch the spoil. We see it here in verse 10, the 10 sons of Haman, the sons of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews slew they, but on the spoil laid they not their hand. We'll see it at the end of verse 15. It says, and they slew 300 men at Shushan, but on the prey they laid not their hand. Verse 16, the end, it says, and slew their four seventy and 5,000, but they laid not their hands on their prey. And it seems that they were following the noble example of their great forefather, Abraham, who when he was offered the spoils of the battle by the king of Sodom, he refused them and was able to say that he had lifted up his hand to the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread even to a shoe latchet, that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. That's from Genesis 14, verse 22 and 23. And so Abraham refused the spoils, and so did these, his natural descendants. They did not lay hands on the spoil. Now, again, we'll, we'll think more about their reasoning for not doing that when we get to verse 15 and verse 16. But it's just telling us that they, they had opportunity, but they didn't lay hands on the spoil. In fact, it would have been quite legal, quite permissible, based on the king's decree for them to to, to get great spoil from their enemies, but they didn't. So verse 11 says, On that day, the number of those that were slain in Shushan the palace was brought before the king. And the king said to Esther the queen, The Jews have slain and destroyed 500 men in Shushan the palace and the ten sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? In other words, if they've done that here, what's the final extent of all this? And we're going to get the final tally in this section. 
But then he says, now what is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request further? And it shall be done. So once again, he asks Esther if she had any other request. It already granted so much to Esther, proving his affections for her. And he had promised her much. Remember, he had offered her even up to half of his kingdom. And he's saying, okay, what else would you like? So Esther tells us in verse 13, says, then said Esther, again, in a submissive and respectful way, if it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews, which are in Shushan, to do tomorrow also according to this day's decree, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. So Esther is emboldened and yet still submissive. And so she's asking one more day to rout the enemies of the Jews. Evidently, the 500 did not cover the full extent of the anti-Semitic hatred that lurked within the palace, within the Shushan, the palace. And so they were asking for one more day to rout out the enemies. And also uh, for Mordecai's 10 sons already dead to be hanged on the gallows. Uh, why was that necessary? Well, it would certainly prove a deterrent to all around. This is what happens to those that mess with the Jews. <laughs> Don't do this. Here's, a, here's a, a, a historical object lesson. It's a folly to mess with the Jews. This is what will happen to you. There'll be serious consequences. These are the people of God. You be careful about what you do concerning these people. And isn't it sad that one of the great lessons of history is that people do not learn the lessons of history. Uh, that's, that's a great sadness, a great folly that people don't get it. Uh, somehow people think they can do it themselves and get away with it. And that's going to happen right up to the very end of the age uh, when there's the final attack at Armageddon. They'll think we're going to finally deal with these people now. And again, once again, they will be doomed to failure because they've refused to learn the lesson of history. So verse 14, we read, and the king commanded it so to be done. And the decree was given at Shushan and they hanged Haman's ten sons. Yes, Shushan was the very center of the Hamanite hatred of the Jews. And any remaining remnant of those Hamanite haters of the Jews must be rooted out and slain. Failure to do this would result in future uh, upsurge of anti-Semiticism and Jewish hostility. And so the king granted the extension of the decree for which Esther had asked. Subsequent action proved that there were indeed another 300 enemies of the Jews in Shushan who had escaped the first day and were now slain on the second day. And we see that in verse 15. For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together on the 14th day also of the month Adar and slew 300 men at Shushan. Once again, on the prey, they laid not their hands. And so again, don't we see how much influence and support Haman had within the citadel? 800 people in total would have been sympathetic to him and his goals. And now they were finally routed out. And what about in the entire empire? Well, in verse 16, it says, but the other Jews that were in the king's provinces gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies and slew of their foes 70 and 5,000, but they laid not their hands on the prey. So this gives us a sum total of 75,800. And if you divide that by the 127 provinces, it means that in, in each province, on average, there were 596 Jew haters who had sought the Jews' description, um, destruction. And what that tells us is that everywhere throughout the province, there is this anti-Semitic feeling lurking uh, amongst people. Not the majority, 
but it's there in a substantial number, 596 on average in each of the provinces based on dividing the 127 into the 75,800. What's interesting too is we have this emphasis again on they laid not their hands to the spoil. We said three times the record states it. And we think about this, it's interesting, isn't it, that it was taking spoil from the enemy that King Saul had lost his kingdom. Do you remember he was supposed to slaughter everything of the Amalekites, but he kept the best of the flock and spared the king, and it lost him his kingdom. But in the Jews' case, they didn't want to repeat his mistake, but they were, they were not after the wealth. Uh, they wanted to prove this, that this was not covetousness that drove this slaughter. It was just self-defense. They wanted only to protect themselves and vindicate their right to live safely in the empire. That's their only motive. And they only killed those who first attacked them. They were not the aggressors. They were defending themselves against a hostile enemy, but they had certainly had no covetous motivation. You could see why they would think this way, because if they had have taken the spoil, that could have caused resentment. See how rich these Jews are. How did they get there? Well, they stole the money from us, and it would have caused further resentment down the, uh, the, the time frame. And so basically what we find is that we're told again and again that they did not in seek to lay their hand on the spoil because they were simply defending themselves against a hostile enemy and that was their purpose so we move on now in verse 17 through 19 to these days of feasting and gladness part of the, the reason for the importance of the book of Esther is to give us an explanation of this feast celebrated by the Jews, which was not part of the original holy days that were given to Israel by God in Leviticus chapter 23. If you've ever studied the Feast of Jehovah, you'll know that there were seven festivals that were given to the nation, but if you were Suddenly looking at Jewish culture today, you would say, well, actually, there's now eight. There's another festival that wasn't part of the original seven. And some might be caused this question, well, is it biblical? Is what they're doing a biblical festival at all? Is there any validity for such a festival? And the book of Esther tells us the validity for this particular festival. It gives it, if you like, its biblical justification. This is where the feast comes from uh, the feast of Purim. Actually, if you were to go to Israel now, there are nine festivals because there's another one. And uh, uh, the other one, the, the Hanukkah festival of lights is to do with an, uh, an historical event that took place in the 400 silent years. Uh, and, uh, and so th there's actually uh, nine of them now, uh, but that is from the Apocrypha, and we're not going to spend time studying the Apocrypha, at least in this session. Uh, but uh, just as we consider verses 17 through 19, uh, and this institution of this festival, it says on the 13th day of the month, Adar, and on the 14th day of the same rested day, and made it a day of feasting and gladness. And you can understand why they would want to feast and be glad because their enemies have been destroyed. There's a, a sense now of security, of peace. Uh, the enemies have been put to the sword, as it were, and now they can enjoy a rest uh, from their enemies, a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews that were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day thereof and on the 14th thereof. And on the 15th day of the same, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. So throughout the provinces, uh, they had fought their battles on the 13th, they'd rested on the 14th, but when it came to Shushan, remember they got an extra day. So they battled 13th, 14th, and then the 15th became their day of feasting and gladness. 
Therefore, the Jews of the villages that dwelt, verse 19, in the unwalled towns made the 14th day of the month Adar a day of gladness and feasting and a good day and of sending portions one to another. It was a day of giving gifts one to another uh, of, uh, as, a, as a celebration, uh, a bit like goes on at Christmas and things like that. So it was a, it was a, it was a very great celebration. Uh, they'd been spared from destruction. Obviously, they're very happy. And it was a very special day throughout the provinces, throughout the villages. So while Purim is certainly not a Christian festival, we certainly can rejoice uh, with the Jews because, uh, in a sense, we're debtors to the Jews. Every spiritual blessing that we enjoy comes to us, in a sense, through the Jewish nation. Uh, salvation is of the Jews, the Lord said to the woman of Samaria in John 4, verse 22. They gave us the Savior. They gave us the scriptures. And we should indeed uh, be thankful that they were spared uh, from this destruction, because where would our scriptures be? Where would our Messiah be if this had not uh, have taken place? So it's ironic that the book of Esther began with a feast that lasted for 187 days. And as we move towards the end of it, we have a feast that has lasted for centuries, the Feast of Purim. Began with 187 days and now a feast that has continued for centuries. So this institution of this annual feast, verses 20 down to verse 22, it said, Mordecai, I wrote those thing, these things and sent letters to all the Jews that were in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, both nigh and far, to establish this among them, that they should keep the 14th day of the month Adar and the 15th day of the same yearly, as the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies and the month which was turned into them from sorrow to joy and from mourning to a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy and of sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. And so Mordecai basically uh, writes this official legal document on behalf of the king uh, commanding the Jews throughout the provinces to celebrate on the 14th and on the 15th day of their great deliverance. So <clears throat> the 15th day is included because the Jews in Shushan were still fighting for their freedom on the 14th day, so the both days are included. And so the Jews were united in their victory and primarily had been divided in their celebration prior to Mordecai sending out this decree because the provinces would have done it on the 14th day and the uh, those in Shushan would have done it on the 15th day. And so in order to uh, eliminate any division in their celebration, Mordecai issued a letter that instructed all Jews to celebrate on both 14th and the 15th day of the month. Today, uh, the Jews begin their celebration with a fast on the 13th day of the month, commemorating the date on which Haman's evil decree was issued. During that feast day, uh, although it's a fast, they go to the synagogue, as we've already talked about, the book of Esther is publicly read on the 13th day. And whenever the name Haman is mentioned, they cry out, cry out, may he be accursed, may he be accursed, may his name perish. And the children bring special Purim rattles called Gregar, Gregar, G-R-E-G-A-R. And every time uh, Haman's name is read, they make a noise with this rattle, trying to drown out the name. And so it's kind of a quite the occasion, uh, the 13th day, and then the 14th day and 15th day of celebration days, days of giving presents, uh, days of rejoicing, uh, days of feasting. It was a good day 
had joyously sent presents one to another, gifts also for the poor were distributed uh, in Jerusalem when they celebrate on the 15th day. Uh, they actually call that day Shushan Purim because it celebrates the idea that um, Shushan's was a day later. So it would seem ironical that the day which Haman had planned for the destruction of the Jews became an annual festival in celebration of the defeat of Haman's plans. He had wickedly, wickedly plotted the, king, the, the killing of all Jews, but instead he and his sons were all slain. He had prepared gallows on which to hang Mordecai, but he had been hanged there himself. His plan had been to eliminate the worship of Mordecai's God because such worship prevented Jews from bowing in homage to him. But instead, many of the people of the provinces actually became Jews. And so you'd have to say that Haman's plans were a complete and utter failure. And everything that he tried to do, as it were, God turned it around and turned it out to become a blessing to the Jews and a curse to him. So verse 23 tells us this, and the Jews undertook to do as they had begun and as Mordecai had written unto them, because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had devised against the Jews to destroy them and had cast purr, that is the lot, to consume them and to destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letters that this his wicked device, which he devised against the Jews, should return upon his own head, that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. Wherefore, they called these days Purim after the name of Pur. Now, here's an interesting thing. So the festival, Purim, I am, whenever you see that, is a pluralizer in Hebrew. So when you see Kerubim, right? I am is a pluralizer. Elohim, pluralizer. It's always a pluralizer. And so Purim, if Pur is lot, Purim is the plural. It means lots. And if you remember, he kept having to cast the lot to get the right day. And he kept doing it. And he started in the springtime and ended up back uh, in the following spring. And so basically a lot of lots were cast. And so Purim really originates from Haman's casting lots to determine the day when the Jews would be destroyed by Esther. And that became the name of this festival. And so it says, therefore, for all the words of this letter and of all uh, uh, and of that day which they had seen concerning this matter and what which had come unto them, the Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as joined themselves unto them, so as it should not fail that they would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their appointed time every year. And that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, every city. And that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. And so you get some of the solemnity of this. It's this festival. They're solemnly charged to keep it from generation to generation. And the reason is so they don't forget God's great deliverance that he had undertaken for them. And that's why we keep a festival on the first day of the week, right? We meet to remember, lest we forget, lest we, I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. And so we have this festival, not once a year, but on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, well, we also do the same thing because we do not ever want to forget the extent of God's amazing deliverance from us, not just from physical death, but from eternal death in the lake of fire. 
and at what cost was provided for us. And so the solemnity of it is brought home to them that they should do this. And then it says in verse 29, the royal confirmation, then Esther the queen, the daughter of Abihail, Mordecai the Jew, wrote with all authority to confirm the second letter of Purim. And he sent the letters to all the Jews so that 120 and seven provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus with words of peace and truth to confirm these days of Purim in their times appointed according as Mordecai the Jew and Esther the queen had enjoined them and as they had decreed for themselves and for their seed the matters of the fastings and their cry and the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim and it is written in the book in other words it's recorded in the book and of course that book would be the the annals, if you like, remember the, the records of the, um, the events of the kingdom of Persia. But not only that, it's also written in another book, isn't it? It's written in the word of God. And it's here for us to understand why this was enacted. A letter written by Mordecai, signed by Queen Esther, circulated throughout the provinces, addressing the Jews to keep the Feast of Purim. Amazing, really, again, to think about this. An orphan Jewess and her guardian, and now the queen and prime minister of the largest Gentile empire ever seen till that time in history. Such are the ways of God who is in control, although out of sight. And that's what we've seen as we've gone through extra at the book of Esther. The second world empire ends with a Jew as near as possible to the chief ruler. Remember the first of the four world empires, Babylon, well, it ended with Daniel as near as possible to being the chief of that empire. Now we have Mordecai at the second world empire in a position of great power daniel in babylon mordecai in persia and there's just a brief epilogue and we want to finish it because we want to move on to pastures new next time but the epilogue is the final three verses and it's really just simply to um, emphasize the greatness of mordecai and so we'll just read it quickly. It says, The king Ahasuerus laid a tribute upon the land and upon the isles of the sea, and all the acts of his power and of his might, and the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, whereunto the king advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was next to King Ahasuerus, and great among the Jews, and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people, and speaking peace to all his seed. Mordecai was, was a great man, who rose to great heights. But one of the marks of his greatness was this, that not only did he oversee the defeat of the enemy, but he also was accepted of the multitude of his brethren. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? It's one thing to defeat the enemy. It's another thing to win over the brethren. And he was accepted of the brethren, and they knew that he was seeking the wealth of his people and speaking peace or speaking shalom to all his seed, because that's the word that's found there. So it's all written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Persia. And John Wesley says this, the books of the Chronicles of the Kings writing in his notes on the Old Testament, he says, these are lost long ago and buried in oblivion, while the sacred writings, including the book of Esther, remain throughout the world. Isn't it amazing? The important documents that seem so significant in the kingdom of Persia, they're lost to posterity. But the word of God abides forever when the kingdoms of men and monarchs and their monarchies are all destroyed their memorialists perish with them the kingdom of god among men and the records of that kingdom shall 
remain as the days of heaven. Just one final thought and we're done. And that is this. One thing the Bible tells us about the Jewish people is that whoever touches them touches the apple of God's eye. It's like trying to stick your finger in the eye of God. And it's not advised. <laughs> there are great consequences to dealing with this people. Uh, we need to thank God for them. We need to pray for them. Like Paul, his heart's desire, prayer to God for Israel was that they might be saved. But we also need to be thankful for them. We owe a great debt to the Jewish nation. And again, that ends our thoughts on the book of Esther. Pastures new next time. May God encourage us with these things. Amen.